Today I'm going to be talking about old school hacking, which is a lot of different things. I'm going to start with uh, uh, some a little bit of history, and then scroll through the century really fast, and end up on some Windows viruses that did a lot of damage, and uh, then kind of stop in 2003 because that was over a decade ago, and that's old school enough. And uh, yeah, let's go. So the first hacker that I could find is Neville Maskelyne. Uh, this guy was an inventor and a stage musician in the early 1900s. Uh, and he hacked a wireless telegraph machine when it was being demoed in 1903. The operator and creator of the machine said that the telegraph machine could be configured to send messages that could not be eavesdropped upon uh, because the person who was using another machine would have to know the settings of the original machine. And uh, our good friend Neville decided to instead transmit messages to the machine that was being used for the demo. And he tapped out several insults in Morse code, uh, of course, <laughs> Morse code, to uh, the creator saying he was diddling the people with his claims of his secure telegraph, uh, which is not unlike how hackers operate today hacking into things <laughs> and using it to insult people. So uh, now we're really jumping uh, through time. We're going to uh, talk about Alan Turing. So Alan Turing is often called the father of computer science because he's a hero. Uh, he formalized the concepts of algorithms uh, with his theories about computing. And he kind of like created the idea of theoretical computer science. Uh, and he also developed the bomb, a machine to break the Enigma machine, the German cipher machine that encrypted messages in World War II. And it's widely believed that the ability of the Allies to decrypt these messages is what won us the war. So uh, if you haven't seen the Imitation Game, go see it. Uh, I was supposed to include a picture of Enigma in here, but I forgot. This is bomb, the machine that did it. Uh, the way the Enigma machine worked uh, is it had a bunch of rotors that would like be set to different initial positions and then you would type stuff out and the rotors would turn and it would uh, cause different letters to be output. And so this was an electromechanical, hi Brian, machine that uh, would try a bunch of different settings really quickly, like a brute force attack uh, today, except you know really large, that's like a cabinet. Uh, so it couldn't break Enigma on its own. It could just eliminate large swaths of possible settings. So it would check. Uh, you would have a known plain text, which would have to be found by like analysis of the messages. And then you'd have to check it against uh, a, all of the settings uh, with Bomb. And it would figure out, like, OK, this, these are the possible settings that could get us here. And then you'd have to do more analysis. And so the reason this worked is because the Enigma machine would never encrypt a letter to itself. Like if you had an A, it would never be an A, which is bad. Like it sounds like, oh, that's good. It will never be the same letter. But no, that tells you something about the original message, which is bad. What it tells you in particular is that this character, whatever, is not whatever it is right now. And that's leaking information about the encrypted message, which if you take crypto with Zach Peterson, you will learn is the worst thing you can possibly do. So that's pretty much like the whole entire attack on Enigma is that it doesn't, it can't make a letter itself. And so that's how they broke it. So next up in history is Grace Hopper, who is uh, kind of the queen of modern computer science. She invented the very first compiler for the language A in 1952, was the original release. So, you know, C does come from a place, it's not just called C, it's because it came after B, and B came after A, the first ever programming language. And uh, when she told people that she had this compiler, people were like, you can do things with computers besides math? She was like, yeah, man, right on. <laughs> and <laughs> she also coined the term debugging, which you probably have heard, shocker, uh, after removing a moth from a relay in a mainframe computer that she was working on. Uh, and she kept the moth in her journal. Uh, that's the bug. That's the first bug bug. And uh, so really, after Alan Turing and Grace Hopper, 
that's sort of like they're basically the boundary from like you know let's play with switches and stuff to let's do computer science as we know it today where you write programs so sort of from there there's a lot of development in computer science blah 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 and then we hit the 70s where we get to phone freaking and phone freaking was manipulating phone systems by sending different tones. So phones would be computer controlled because uh, they got rid of phone operators because there were a lot of people who used phones. Uh, and uh, the computers would listen for different tones to come over the line. So like when you press out numbers on a phone and it goes pop, 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 pop. Those are actual tones that are supposed to send commands. So older phone systems, they didn't separate the voice line from the control line. So that means they had like an in-band system of control. Uh, so you could send commands to the phone server just with the voice receiver on the phone, which was bad because then you could use tone generators uh, to get toll-free calls and do all sorts of other stuff. So phone freaking is kind of like the big resurgence of hacking, like the, major, the only major event in hacking before this is really the breaking of the Enigma machine, then not a lot happened, and then phone freaking is when it really became popular for the general public. And uh, uh, Freak is actually the basis of the Phantom Freak's name in the movie Hackers. It's spelled the PH. He's a baller. And that's Joey in the background. He couldn't come up with a cool name. <laughs> uh, so the most famous phone freaker is Captain Crunch. Although there have been a bunch of other famous phone freakers like uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, his real name was John Draper, and he was a total hippie. Uh, he lived in and out of other people's houses virtually forever. Still does that. I think now he's cruise couch surfing in Vegas. Uh, but he discovered that a whistle that came in the Captain Crunch cereal uh, would produce a frequency of precisely 2600 hertz, which with, when sent over a phone line, would uh, hang up the call and enable the AT&T trunk line to send commands directly to the server, where you could then say, like, connect to a long distance call for no fee. And so this sound, which sounds like this, and is made by a Captain Crunch whistle, uh, <laughs> was kind of like, is very iconic in hacker culture, 2600 hertz. There's actually a hacker group, or was a hacker group named 2600. It's like a, You'll hear it in places, now you know what it means. So he got arrested for lots of types of fraud. Uh, <laughs> and that wasn't great for him. But uh, he's very famous. You'll hear about Captain Crunch a lot. And uh, he actually taught Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak how to phone freak before they founded Apple. So uh, if you like your iPhones, you like John Draper. Uh, and one of the more famous stories, but unsubstantiated, is that he allegedly freaked a phone call to President Nixon. He was able to hack the servers that were responsible for phone routing and call Nixon's personal telephone. Yeah? Did he do it using the Otterbahn network or the regular phone network? I have no idea. Uh, this is all alleged. It's never I'm been substantiated. Beats me. Uh, mm -mm. Uh, but uh, apparently, allegedly, when he called President Nixon, he asked uh, about the underwear shortage in Los Angeles and what President Nixon was going to do about it. And allegedly, President Nixon got very unhappy about that. <laughs> so uh, back here, this box on the right, this is called a blue box. It's a box capable of generating all the tones that a phone will use, which is why it has the numbers on it. Uh, and so if you know the commands of the phone system, then you can say, like, oh, I just put in a quarter. I just put in another quarter. Oh, man, I just put in five bucks of quarters. <laughs> <laughs> and make long distance calls and all sorts of great shit. Stop. OK. So now we're getting into actual viruses. Uh, one of the first viruses, this is actually a worm, called Christmas Exec. It's, uh, it totally paralyzed the private international networks that were available in 87. 
So that is like the European Academic Research Network, BitNet, and IBM's VNet. Uh, these networks were totally trashed by this machine, or this virus, written in RecScript. I don't know what that is, actually, but uh, it's old. <laughs> it runs on IBM mainframes that don't have actual access to the real internet because this is 1987 and it didn't exist, strictly speaking. Uh, and so all this virus did is it drew a Christmas tree in text graphics on the display and then sent itself to all the email contacts of the mainframe user. Uh, <laughs> so nobody really knew what a worm was at this time. So it, that's why it caused so much damage, is it would clog up mail servers and fill up mainframe disks. Uh, it actually didn't do anything particularly sophisticated. It would actually ask the user. It would say, just type Christmas, and then it infected their machine. So like it, it was in no way like a sophisticated worm designed to like screw people over. It was just like, hee. <laughs> so the next big worm, uh, considered basically the first worm, even though it came after Christmas exec, because it was the first worm to spread over the open internet, it is also called the Great Worm. It was made by Robert Tappan Morris at Cornell in 98. And uh, I just said that. And he originally made it to gauge the size of the internet, but instead he wrecked everything. Uh, because uh, what, he, what he did, it was an interesting way to gauge the size of the internet. He exploited a bunch of vulnerabilities in common daemons and uh, exploited weak passwords to hack into machines to get this count of things. And, uh, the, and he, didn't, he says he didn't mean to wreck anything and that this was just a mistake. But in order to prevent the... Uh, it would, what it would do is it would ask the machine, have I infected you yet? And it was just a really simple question. And in order to prevent people from starting a service on their machine that was their own, that just said yes every time someone asked so it wouldn't infect them, he made it to one seventh of the time it would infect the machine anyway. So this is why it trashed the internet, because one seventh of the, the time it would infect the same machine and then it would do it again and again and again. And so eventually, this worm was running gazillions of times on every single machine, and nobody could get it off. And it took forever to get rid of it. Uh, but the reason it's called the Great Worm is, well, A, because it wrecked everything. And it's actually named after a couple of dragons in the Tolkien universe, Middle Earth, because dragons were powerful enough to lay waste to entire regions, like the internet. And it's named after the Great Worms, Skatha and Glarung, which is weird. Uh, <laughs> so the next big attack uh, that is like kind of famous in hacker culture is WinNuke, and uh, the source was actually released in '97, which was uh, very convenient for people because what it would do is it would spam out-of-bound packets to TCP port 139 uh, on Windows machines, and what this would and what this means is like the packets had the urgent flag set in one of the uh, TCP headers. And the problem with this is urgent is basically never used. Like they put it in the spec and then nobody was cared at it, about it at all and everyone ignores it. But uh, because there wasn't, nobody used it, there wasn't a lot of logic to handle this. So you would run WinNuke on a machine and it would instantly blue screen very reliably. <laughs> so uh, in 97, not a lot of people had firewalls. People were kind of just connected to the internet. So you could win nuke any arbitrary machine if you had their IP address, which was a great time for hackers because, man, that's easy. Like, <laughs> you don't even have to do anything. After this, though, hacking gets really, really boring. Uh, as far as like what kind of viruses people were making, there were no Christmas trees or like instant nukes of machines. Instead, you get a lot of uh, email worms. So in 1999, one of the first major email worms called Melissa was, which was written in a macro language that's embedded in Microsoft Word documents, not anymore, for obvious reasons. Uh, it sent itself to the first 50 Outlook contacts that you had uh, in your Outlook address book. 
and it affected 20% of computers worldwide, which is not that many because we have bigger ones, like I Love You. It's pretty much the same idea as Christmas Exec. It's an attachment that has, uh, that's actually a script. It's written in Visual Basic Script, and it sent itself to all your contacts. Shocker again. Uh, the attachment name was <laughs> Love Letter for You, which is creative. Uh, and since it come, comes from your acquaintances, it appears safe, like you're getting it from other people. And this is the first time where you know, a lot of Windows users are seeing this kind of attack. And this is kind of why uh, when we were kids, everyone would tell us, don't open email attachments from people you don't know. And be careful with email attachments from people you do know. It's because in 2000 and 2001, this was everything going around the internet. Just like, there's like three more of these. So like, hold on to your butts. Uh, the really bad thing about this one, though, is it would find files on your machine that looked important, and it would just overwrite their data. <laughs> so that was unfriendly. Uh, so it originated in the Philippines, and it spread to Hong Kong and Europe and then the US as each country like, successively woke up from their work day and like, checked their email. So it spread across the world like at the same time that the globe rotated. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how it made it around. And it affected tens of millions of machine, machines crippling mail networks because there was so much traffic being generated from all of these uh, infected machines spamming all of their contacts that uh, the mail servers that uh, people were using would get totally crushed. Because of this, the Pentagon, the CIA, and Parliament all shut down their mail servers so that they wouldn't get infected, uh, which is hilarious. <laughs> but, uh, and then this stuff just goes on and on. I don't have, I only have a few examples. The next one is uh, Anna Kornikova virus. And this one uh, wasn't even particularly interesting. It was just some guy ran a worm generator made by an Argentinian hacker. And he was like, hey, I created a worm. Now I'm going to send it to a news group. And so he did. It was basically the same attack as I Love You, except uh, it didn't do anything. Once it infected people, it just mailed everyone. Uh, and the attachment, instead of I Love You, .txt.vbs was supposed to be a JPEG of the famous Russian tennis player, Anna Kornikova, hence the name. Uh, and the creator didn't even know what he had done or that it would do things like spread. He just did it. So he actually turned himself into the police, uh, which is another reason everyone didn't want to open attachments at this time because everyone and their mom was making worms and shooting them all over the internet. Uh, but this one happened to be particularly big. Uh, then another, <laughs> shocker, uh, Klez is another worm of the same variety. But this one uh, was where the email worms actually got serious. It included some HTML that would exploit a vulnerability in the email client, Microsoft Outlook, and it would cause the uh, attachment to automatically be run. And it would send all your contacts. And then it got even more creative. It would pick a random from address out of your contacts. And it would spoof who it sent the email from. So you couldn't tell who was infected, because it just picked a name and email at random and was like, it's from me. Not. And uh, so you couldn't tell who was infected. And it made it a lot harder to clean machines, because you basically just had to clean all the machines on your network uh, because you couldn't tell at all who was infected. Uh, and that's, that's where things actually really start getting dangerous with email clients because normally you have to open the attachment in order for it to get you. But with this one, you just have to open it in Outlook and you're done. You don't have to open the attachment at all. So moving on from email crap. Uh, made from the same city in the Philippines as I Love You was a virus called Code Red. And what it actually did was exploited a buffer overflow in the Microsoft Internet, ex Internet something something service, the Microsoft web server. And it uh, would 
just spread by infecting one server, and then that server would uh, start searching for other web servers and try to infect them too. And it spread really fast, and then every once in a while, it would decide all of the servers that were infected would decide to DOS the White House uh, <laughs> for one week out of every month. Uh, and Code Red is literally named after the Mountain Dew. <laughs> that's, that's it. Uh, so that's, uh, that virus, though, that worm was particularly prolific and problematic because it generated so much traffic on the internet that there was like a noticeable slowdown because all these web servers were clogging each other up, right? But even worse than that was the slammer. The slammer is the fastest spreading worm of all time. In 15 minutes, it infected hundreds of thousands of machines because it didn't give a single fuck. Uh, <laughs> it exploited a buffer overflow on Microsoft SQL Server in early 2003, uh, a vulnerability that was actually patched six months earlier, and nobody ran updates because people didn't do that at that time, apparently. Uh, and the reason it was so problematic is it would literally spin loop sending copies of the virus to random IP addresses on the internet, uh, which is why it spread so fast, because it would, come, it would take the entire internet connection of the server and just dump packets onto the network. And this uh, attack actually was exploitable via UDP, so it didn't have to initiate connections. It could just send a packet and, be like, and infect something if it was infectable. Uh, so it just hosed the internet, and then everyone else who got infected started hosing the internet. And it actually uh, caused so much traffic that it caused massive waves of router crashes. Uh, routers would be getting so much data that they'd like try and throttle it, and then they just wouldn't be able to take it, and they'd crash. And then other routers would notice that that router had crashed. And so they'd add to the huge data flood by saying, like, wait, this guy crashed. And he would try and tell his router buddies. <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then that router would crash, and everyone was trying to figure out who had crashed and what routes to use and how to send packets around the internet. But uh, that didn't work because there were so many routers going down. And then network administrators started restarting their routers, of course. So the routers came back up and said, hey, guys, I'm here. You can route packets to me. <laughs> Which caused even more router crashes. And uh, the entire internet kind of just like collapsed for a while there. Uh, what was interesting about this is because the packet that could infect a machine was only like 300 and something bytes. Since it was so small and since it was only one packet, that packet would actually get through the routing glitches more often than legitimate traffic. So <laughs> that was really one hell of a worm. So the last sort of big worm I want to talk about is Blaster, which got a ton of media attention. Uh, and that's kind of why it's the last one on the list is it's extraordinarily famous. If you were around in 2003 paying attention at all, Blaster was on the news, uh, on TV, on the radio, because people still had radios in 2003. Uh, and yet again, a buffer overflow in the RPC services of Windows. Uh, and again, problems with updating the people, the Writers of the virus actually reverse engineered the patch that fixed this vulnerability that Microsoft sent out, figured out what the vulnerability was from that patch, and then wrote a virus for it. Like Microsoft fixed it, then they wrote the virus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, because of the media sensation, it didn't spread nearly as much as Slammer. But again, it sends itself to random IP addresses. And all of these IP addresses would then try and flood windowsupdate.com with TCP connections, which didn't actually do anything because windowsupdate.com just redirected to windowsupdate.microsoft.com. So it didn't affect Microsoft's update service at all, even a little bit. <laughs> uh, so that was interesting. But in the binary, it contained a message for Bill Gates, which said, <laughs> Billy Gates. Why do you make this possible? Stop making money and fix your software. Uh, but yeah, the, the reason I actually decided to write this talk is because I remembered Blaster from 2003. I remember that being the thing that everyone was talking about. 
It's an extremely notorious worm, uh, especially because of another virus based on blaster called Wolchia. And Wolchia is a fork of blaster that uses the same exploit vector to attack computers. So, you know, like, okay, we've had the patch, and then we have a virus made from it, then we have another one made from it. We're still going here, and people aren't updating their machines. It's a big problem. Uh, but actually, after infecting the machine, it would delete Blaster and then patch the machine to fix the vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is what is known as a friendly virus or helpful virus because it would literally infect machines and then fix them. Like, that's 100% what it did. It actually was even programmed to remove itself uh, in 2004 or after 120 days. Like, what a bro. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is sort of like we're stopping in 2003, but, and that's kind of like the end of the old days of hacking where this, it was all about email spam and worms that would infect everything. And, and after, after this time, uh, hacking starts to get a lot more sophisticated. You can't just like find a buffer overflow in some random program and then trash everything. Like people start actually making secure decisions, sort of, more secure decisions <laughs> than before. But also around this time is when anonymous really started being a thing. This is when the whole anonymous identity started on 4chan and uh, kind of grew into the hacker group that we know today, although they were a bunch of dick kids in 2003, so it's, it's not much of a start, but it is a start. <laughs> and so, Sort of there, 2003 is kind of like where the old days end and the new guard of hacking shows up. And so now, uh, actually later throughout the quarter, we're going to have a number of talks about more modern vulnerabilities and hacks. Uh, Maggie's doing a talk on Stuxnet, which is one of the most sophisticated viruses that was ever created. Uh, we'll also probably have some people talking about Flame, yes? Hardbleed, which is a vulnerability in OpenSSL. Jared's doing that one. Uh, someone should talk about Flame. Someone should talk about Conficker, which was on it. I'll talk about Conficker. Oh, yeah. Research one of those things. Research Somebody research Flame or Conficker and give a talk on it. Conficker is a great one. That was So Conficker is a worm, much like Blaster, except it's really sophisticated to get around other types of security. Uh, it's actually a spread in 2009, so it's fairly recent compared to Blaster. But uh, yeah, somebody give a talk besides me. Let's do it. <laughs> Yay.